Indeed, a person of interest. Time for that report by Rita Tanina setting the stage for us. Arguably, indeed, one of the most highly achieved uh, scholars of Kenya, an influential man, Professor Ali Mazrui. As we told you earlier, they're set to be buried in Mombasa this Saturday, according to his wish, so his body to be flown from New York. And joining me in studio to talk more about this man, the journey that he walked and the impact and the mark that he's left in the world are two professors, one on the way, he will be joining us later. But Professor Masharia Munene on my immediate left is Professor of History and International Relations at the USIU, Karibu Sana. And also with us this morning is Professor Kimani Njogu, who's Director of Tuawes communication and chair of the national kiswahili association we thank you both for being with us this morning and let's begin with how you remember him um and, and even as you received the news yesterday you've both interacted with him let's begin with you professor munene how do you remember him um the intellectual that he was yes um unique person very humble very accommodating and willing to engage. Uh, he's a man who loved intellectual controversy mm. and uh, he thrived in it. And that's why he stood out because almost everyone had something to say about him, either agree or disagree. And uh, there are not many people in the world who can achieve that. Yes. Uh, in terms of comparison, uh, in the entire 20th century and even up to today, there are few people who uh, measure up to him at the intellectual level. Um, in Africa, the one or two people I can think about is Sheikh Diop of Senegal. Yes. Um, and then uh, you disappear, the others disappear somewhere below. Uh, so um, he came at the right time in terms of um, production, I mean, uh, contribution to knowledge, mainly at the time of independence, when it appeared that you are. Africans were looking for forces that would put them on the map. Mm. And he did it in the social sciences. Um, unfortunately, there are not very many people of his generation who are still alive at that level. We have uh, one or two people, but uh, they seem to have been disappearing. But of all those people who were with him at the time, he ended up towering over them. Right. And uh, that made him very unique in that sense. Did you have any personal engagements with him? And if so, at that level, what is it for you that you took away from his life? Well, um, I can say I think I encountered him about three times. Mm -hmm. um, uh, twice when I was a graduate student um, at Ohio. And uh, the encounter was not uh, the most pleasant. Oh, really? I would say. <laughs> not between me and him, yeah. but the, the, the presentation he was making. That's the time he was um, uh, being attacked left and right uh, for representing some views that were not necessarily very popular. Um, the one time when I remember, he almost cried, wept, because of the attack. Eh? It was during the Angolan crisis. Mm. And he was making a very good presentation but his argument sounded as if it was coming from Gerald Ford. And so some people <laughs> hit him very hard. Okay. And so on that, and um, they're questioning his patriotism. And he came out in very strong defense. Um, that was one of those unique situations. Um, he redeemed himself thereafter with his television series, uh, The Africans. And uh, you could see in The Africans, uh, it seems that now to have rubbed the other side badly, then they came out. Yes, Mazuri now has, has come of age mm. as representative of the African perception on what was going on in the world. Yeah. The triple heritage was the classic, uh, uh, something to be remembered all, over, all the time. Okay. The, next, the, third, the next time I interacted with him now on a personal level was when I invited him to come and speak to uh, USIU community. I just wrote him a letter, an email, and he was very gracious. He, he replied very nicely, and he came, mm -hmm. and he talked very nicely in his erudite way. His, uh, he had this ability uh, of being clear. He would say, I'm going to tell you the following, one, two, three, four. 
And then he goes on to tell you one, two, three, four in detail. In more detail. Uh, in right. more detail. And that would be, and uh, so I remember that personal touch. That touch, okay. He would reply to me and come and do, uh, do what I asked him to do. And, and yeah. did very well. Honor yeah. your invest. Professor Njogo will come to you now in terms of how you remember the professor. Yes, I, I first met uh, Professor um, Ali Mazrui um, in 1993, actually, mm -hmm. at the Yale University. Um, and then at the point I was a graduate student um, working on my doctorate. And we invited him to come and talk about issues of globalization. Um, and as usual, you know, an absolutely amazing, brilliant uh, scholar. Um, totally excited by ideas and venturing into areas that one would not have imagined um, at all. Um, I mean, for instance, I mean, he, he came up with this uh, concept that um, uh, almost of an intellectual betrayal uh, of leadership, that leadership, for example, in Africa, mm -hmm. at the point of liberation, was very committed, very focused, very aware, very pan-African. But at the point of post-independence period, African leadership was not able to provide direction in terms of democracy, in terms of development, and so on. Mm. So that was really um, exciting for me, and his ability to play around with words. But what also puzzled me now as a linguist was his inability to speak in Kiswahili Sanifu, and his um, persistence on the Kimvita dialect, which he grew up. This is the dialect spoken in, in Mombasa. And um, that was transformative for me, because it, it, uh, it brought to mind that it's actually language varieties that work other than language, languages that are standardized. Mm. So he had that impact. Then, of course, I, I interacted with him on numerous other occasions through my good friend and his nephew, Alamin Mazrui, who we have co-authored a number of books. Um, and so I would be able to visit them in New York and have amazing conversations. A very humble person. You would actually be um, uh, amazed at how humble the man was, notwithstanding his intellectual capacity and the breadth of um, his reading and the breadth of his understanding of, um, of politics, not just African politics, but also global, global politics. So at a personal level, um, I feel uh, a big loss, mm -hmm. really, um, because of the intellectual uh, uh, engagements that we had. And also, um, in solidarity with my very good friend, who is his nephew, and who he has mentored over the last 30 years, Alamin Mazrui. Okay. So yesterday, uh, we're hosting um, the Senator Mombasa County. And one of the things in remembering him, he said, was that at the very beginning, he wasn't interested in school at all. So to now be seated here talking about this influential person uh, being ranked at one point at one as one of the most uh, intelligent people in the world, 100 top intelligent people. What do you think was that, that transition to, to from a person who's not interested in school? And we see a lot of that with kids nowadays, to such a figure that we're talking about today? You know, it happens that some people bloom late. Yeah. And uh, they, they become serious, uh, not very early, but a little late. Mm. And I think that happened with uh, Ali Mazrui. He, one of the good things about it is that he liked talk to, talking about it, um, that uh, he was not the brightest of the students when he was playing football on this, in the near moment, near for Jesus and mm -hmm. some places. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, <clears throat> and he repeatedly thanked the British for giving him a chance. That's what he said. They give him a chance when he could not have had it. And uh, when uh, he got the second chance, he seized it and then exploited it fully to become the person that he was. Mm. So the, and that calls for the need to give people a second chance. Mm. Because you never know what will happen after that. And actually he's one of them, if I may say, he's a perfect example that mediocrity can excel. Mm -hmm. Because uh, um, he's almost like Albert Einstein. Eh? Albert Einstein was almost in the same way. In, uh, he, in high school he was not the best of anything. 
But once he got into it, he distinguished himself in a particular line that he liked. And Mazrui liked what he was doing when, once he got into the university. And that's why I think he got his, mm -hmm. his mind was tricked by intellect. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's, there's, I think there's, it's, it's also a statement about the nature of our educational system. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, educational system that does not seem to recognize the, you know, and, and appreciate the curious mind. Because Ali Mazrui had this very inquisitive mind and um, uh, it's not a mind that memorizes ideas. It's a, mem it's, it's a mind that explores ideas, looks for opportunities, mm. and so on. And I think that what happened was that when he got the opportunity to go to Manchester University, mm. where ideas are nurtured and opportunities are created, totally different from, say, the colonial educational mm. system, which was based on memorization and you know, basically remembering mm. information and facts and so on, he was able to excel. So it's, it's really, um, it is an indictment in my view, mm -hmm. really, of the colonial educational system that demanded memorization and he could not excel mm -hmm. under that type of system. Yeah. He needed to excel under a new system that celebrated curiosity, inquisitiveness, and uh, exploration of ideas. Yeah. And that's, that's Ali Mazrui at his best, yeah. really. And you've talked about him having that appreciation for what the British was able to give to him that second chance. Mm. But he was also very critical in terms of the tools of oppression, a documentary we want to look at uh, shortly and perhaps talk more about that. The thin line where on one hand there is what you're gaining from mm. this, then on the other hand there is what you believe is not right mm. and should be rectified. So let's take a look at that uh, documentary. Many centuries ago, man in this part of Africa went into partnership with termites to process copper. The Balunda, the Baluba, the Basanga of ancient Zaire used the clay produced by termites to help smelt copper and produce implements of agriculture, weapons of war, sometimes decorations, and money for exchange. A long, long time ago, a strange partnership. And then the Europeans came. Did they want to learn from the technology they found here? Oh no, at least the Baluba and the Balunda had consulted the technology of the termites and benefited from it. But European te technology was more arrogant, more self-confident, less compromising. It abolished the old technological order and in its wake it left new forms of desolation in Africa. It's Professor Ali Mazrui there in a documentary, Tools of Oppression, just a snippet from it. And also joining us in studio to continue with this conversation this morning is Professor Chris Wanjala, literally scholar. We thank you for being with us. And before we go to that, we'll begin where I started with the other gentlemen and professors. Today's quite a professor's <laughs> show. Um, on how you remember the late professor and your encounters with him. Well, um Ali was quite a good friend. I encountered him in Makere when I went to Makere for a writer's workshop. Ngugi had moved to Makere mm -hmm. to be a writer in residence at Makere. And uh, uh, through his influence, he invited us from the Department of Literature at the University of Nairobi. Uh, and uh, that writer's workshop included uh, Ali Mazrui, uh, John Beatty, or oh, Kelo Chil was still a very young man. And uh, what amazed me was uh, that such a, a colossal figure as Mazrui was also a poet. And he was also interested in literature. And he later had to write a novel called The Trial of Christopher Kigbo. Uh, after that, after Makerere, uh, in 1969, uh, I got to know him and we got to know each other uh, so much to the extent that at one time we had to write the writers, the constitution of the Writers Association of Kenya with him, uh, with the help of uh, the late uh, Taita Toet. 
and uh, after that, uh, we were on the first name basis. The last time was in Abana Champagne, uh, when I told him I had gone there for some exchange program, and he rang and said, uh, he complained about age. <laughs> he said, Uzeo Mengia, <laughs> Uzeo Mengia. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, in 1997, he's still a versatile scholar. Uh, and indeed, as a debater, he remained uh, uh, a very lively mind. Uh, later, of course, we have seen him participating in the constitutional formation and uh, indeed debating uh, issues. The other time is uh, when I organized a public lecture at the University of Nairobi for him. Uh, normally, we had to have these public lectures in Taifa Hall. But Mazri, uh, we could not fit into Taifa Hall. Too many so, people. So we had to organize uh, a makeshift kind of podium outside uh, in the Great Court. So he addressed uh, the academic community from the podium mm. in the Great Court, okay. which was really uh, <laughs> a wonderful thing to yeah. see. Yes. All right. Let's uh, go back to that clip we watched, Tools of Oppression. And uh, I'll start with you, Professor Munene, because you're talking about the appreciation he had. Mm -hmm. And then when he comes out then to be a critic of these same people, how do you balance that out? Uh, simple. Uh, he appreciated the opportunity the British gave him as a person. Yes. That does not take away a strict analysis of the reality. And um, I think I mentioned that it is in that documentary that he came of age. Prior to that, he tended to be, to appear, and that's why he was being attacked, to be very defensive of the same British, of the same West. That's what he appeared to be. Mm -hmm. And um, that in this documentary, it was a series of about more than 10 episodes. But uh, the reaction to that series in the West was hostile. In Africa, we said, yes, the man has come home. Eh? Intellectually, he had come home. And he started sounding almost like the way what Walter Rodney would have said mm. in, the, in this, um, the, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. That's what you are getting there. And uh, you see there, he, he believed those things. So here is the evidence. He, his scholarship had led him to that. It's not that he was told to do that. It is his scholarship that had led him to that reality, that this happened. Mm. And in scholarship, we try to distinguish between the personal interests and the reality, the scholarship, the world uh, as it is. And what he was presenting there was the world as he saw it, based on evidence and rising up to a very high level, uh, which, that's why we say that he came of age. And he could say, now you are talking for Africans mm. instead of something else. Yeah. But uh, he's, as a person, he still remained appreciative to the people who helped him along the way, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So, so, yeah, so as a scholar that we saw him even put that, all that, uh, his thoughts uh, in a documentary, your professors, many of you will decide to perhaps pen it down. What do you think about the choice of, uh, putting that and framing it in a documentary. I think it's uh, absolutely amazing that um, he was able not only to write texts, uh, theoretical texts, but also to develop, um, uh, to use the documentary really as a medium of sharing history. Mm -hmm. And talking about um, the ways in which Africa was subjugated, um, annihilated, uh, African cultures totally devalued by the colonial experience and really talking about the complexity of the African continent as a continent that is informed not just by indigenous civilization which unfortunately uh, did not um, mature in quotes uh, courtesy of British colonialism but also the role of uh, the Eastern world the Islamic um, you know contact uh, with Africa um, and, 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 and the, and the Judeo-Christian you know, tradition and so on. So in terms of packaging, and this is really um, a tribute to Ali Mazrui, uh, th that he could be very theoretical, but also very simple in terms of presenting his ideas. Uh, Professor um, Chris Wanjala talked about uh, uh, the novel, you know, The Trial of Christopher Okigbo. 
you know, Ali Mazrui was a political scientist. He was, uh, um, he wrote politics, theoretical politics, and, and so on. But at the same time, was able to engage the novel uh, to talk about the Biafran war and the role of the intellectual in that, in that war. So in a sense, it's, it's as if that he was not satisfied to package uh, his thoughts in one theoretical form, but actually to use different formats of packaging. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for me, the documentary, uh, the triple heritage, I think, and, and the Africans really, um, is such a powerful way of communicating Africa. And that is why uh, it received a uh, um, huge backlash uh, amongst especially uh, some scholars on the continent as well as in Europe because of the very radical, if you want, uh, position that he took in telling the African story. Yeah. yeah, and we still have those kind of scholars, Professor Wanjala, that will put out a message, will put out their thoughts and resonate and impact not only the country but the continent and the world at large. Yes, we do. Uh, that's why Mazuri was rated as one of the top 100 scholars from Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, in Zimbabwe during the book fair, he was one of those uh, uh, called public intellectuals. Uh, public intellectuals are people who, with comfort, move out of their seminar room and uh, lecture hall and perform beyond the seminar room and actually engage with uh, more publics than just the academia, uh, giving lecture to students and uh, marking essays, things like that. Mazuri went beyond that. And you know, Mazuri came from a tradition of writers. He came from uh, a tradition where his own father was a pamphleteer, uh, somebody who wrote uh, uh, documents. So there is a way in which he's unique. Uh, he, he came from a tradition of writing. So that when he went to school, it was really just to reinforce a tradition which was already established mm. in a family which had a library, uh, which was writing, and which was engaging in ideas. So we may argue that there are scholars uh, like him. Of course, Professor Mnena has mentioned uh, uh, Walter Rodney. Uh, there is Mudimbe of, uh, of uh, uh, the Congo and uh, the you know, DRC. Mudimbe is more or less engaging at that level. Mm -hmm. But Mazuri still supersedes uh, most of but uh, those But do we see more coming up, or is it that just that generation, the Achebes that we are talking about, in terms of that space still having more people coming into it? And we had that discussion earlier, and as far as after this generation is gone, then what happens to that space? Uh, there, there is no need to despair. Uh, <laughs> There is somebody who will always come up at the right time with the right uh, qualities, and that person will be recognized for being that. Uh, Mazrui was unique in his own way. Uh, he was unique not only in Africa, but in the world. I guess that's why when he was being rated among the top world intellectuals, uh, not just African, yeah. world intellectuals, uh, it was a recognition. And uh, those unique people are rare not just in Africa, everywhere, but they do come up. We have a lot of young people who are doing their best and they are writing good things and things like that, but it will take time before they can be seen and be recognized to be the force that they are. Uh, some people are lucky that they become recognized as a force almost immediately because of the, the punch they have. And uh, Mazuri had a punch uh, and he continued to have a punch almost to, uh, to his last days. Yeah. Uh, you, at every decade, you can say, Mazuri did that. At every decade, he did that. At every decade. So he had that uh, uniqueness. Uh, other people who in Africa who have that, I mean, Wallace Shoyika has some, something close to that. Mm -hmm. eh? Ngogi has something like that. Uh, John Beatty, I think he has retired. <laughs> but he, at that time, he did. So what I'm saying is that there will be people. It's just difficult to say that you can say it is so and so now until we see it. They'll be there. So you're saying it develops with time, Professor, that develops this time. sort of like mm. marinates up until older age, perhaps? Absolutely. I mean, he has written since 1962. Uh, so 50 years of writing, you know, is substantial. 
And um, I would imagine that uh, the younger scholars, and we do have a yeah. good number mm. of younger scholars, uh, we will be able to appreciate them um, in a few years. I think that uh, I, I am very hopeful that uh, they are there. I also would like to say that the fact that he wrote from the United States mm -hmm. has also be helped significantly because there are certain facilities available in Western academia uh, which are not available in African academia in terms of research grants, in terms of uh, research assistance, um, you know, books and facilities and salaries and so on. Okay, um, and, and let's uh, let me bring you in, Chris, uh, Professor Chris Wanjala, on the fact that even one of the articles today, just paying tribute to him and talking about how controversial he was, uh, Professor Ching, one of the people that he'd get into a lot of back and forth with, and we saw that a lot also with Professor Bethwell or God, where there'd be these intellectual conversations going on between these scholars on matters that are happening across the country, across the continent, and the world, but we don't see a lot of that happening now. We see some people paring down a few articles here and there, but that discourse in terms of the important issues and having an intellectual conversation is not happening. Uh, one thing is uh, the temperament of Mazri was thoroughly intellectual. Although he engaged in debates, he did not only debate with fellow scholars, he debated with politicians. I mean, uh, he could take on uh, Milton Obote and they have a debate. Yes. Uh, Ken uh, Adek, Adoko and so on. Uh, he could have a debate with them. And indeed, uh, uh, Walter Rodney, at one time, you know, they, they, they held a debate. So there is a way in which uh, Mazri defined an intellectual as uh, a person who is fascinated by ideas and can handle them effectively. And uh, so he grew up as a, a public scholar his own study was of the DRC Congo, which was actually talking about peace in the Congo. So yeah. the issues that he took were public issues. So Professor Angela, why private. don't we see that now? Because especially now at a time where political temperatures heightened in the country, there's a lot of politicking left, right, and center. You yes. get a sense that you need some sanity and instilled by perhaps a voice of reason. But we're not getting that. Yes. Why is that? You are right to say that uh, uh, our... There is a way in which uh, local, by the local, I mean people uh, yes. operating from, from Kenya, have not been very, very forthright. Uh, one could remember uh, William Ocheng, who, could, who only challenged Mazuri to a public uh, uh, kind of forum. And when Mazuri accepted, uh, <laughs> he chickened out. Uh, he <laughs> out. <laughs> so there is a way in which, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Njogu has said, Mazuri operated on what he called Olympian Heights. For him, America was like the Olympian Heights, and he could talk to the world from that global scene. But the, the intellectuals who have been operating from, uh, from uh, the local scene have been, uh, so to speak, uh, sort of incapacitated by censorship, harassment, uh, torture, to the extent that uh, people had just to hide their manuscripts under their tables. Uh -huh. And indeed, Mazuri himself had to leave uh, Uganda because he couldn't survive in a means regime. But Professor Munene, hasn't that changed? Hasn't the space opened up? There's more space to freely perhaps express oneself? There, yes, there is freedom to express oneself, not just for the intellectuals, but the entire country. Correct. There's no question about that the facilities for expressing self are not there. And uh, we do have, um, unfortunately, uh, a trend, particularly in Africa, and Kenya is involved in that, where um, university education and university undertaking have been going downwards instead of going up. Mm -hmm. um, the, you rarely find lecturers in their offices thinking. Because one of the main things they're supposed to do is to think, even if what they're thinking is something else. But they're supposed to be thinking yes. and then raising questions. Now, when they are starving, they cannot be thinking. And one of the main uh, arguments is that the, the libraries, the universities, are not as accommodating as they were in the 1970s and 60s and even part of the 1980s. They are not. The, 
you have uh, situations where people are crying about the quality of the university education. Employers are complaining that we are producing half-baked graduates. Why? Because the environment, the intellectual, academic environment at the universities is not what it should be. And therefore, it is kind of too much to expect people who feel suppressed to be able to produce weight. And that's why we keep on inviting experts from outside. When we have our own experts here, we don't pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. We pay attention to somebody else because they, can, they have better facility, they have everything. So I think there is a willingness to engage. Mm -hmm. And that to Kent here, and at least this is part of the engagement. Eh? Yes. <laughs> it's also, it's also professor? Part of, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, yes, that, I think that uh, yeah. ideas thrive best in an environment in which um, people are reading, mm -hmm. people are researching, and people are not struggling over very basic things like food and rent and so on. But uh, if you look at the state of our universities at the moment, where ideas are supposed to be generated, there's such a huge commercialization of university education, such that lecturers and professors are running up and down, you know, um, teaching too many, too many students. And therefore, you cannot have time to reflect and to write and to engage globally um, and to be able to do research to provide informed analysis. And I think this is really something that um, we should all be ashamed of as a country, really. I think that to grow um, a new generation of, of scholars, a new generation of leadership, intellectual leadership, we require an enabling environment. In the United States, there is no professor that does not have a team of researchers working under them. There is no professor who does not have a team of teaching assistants doing, taking care of mark, marking and uh, tutorials and so forth. In our case, actually, we don't have this type of facilitation. So I think that it's an issue of facilitation um, as well as the, enable, the environment. It's not that we have a paucity, an absence of intellectual rigor uh, uh, in the country. We do have that rigor. Most of us are educated in the Western tradition. We understand those ideas. We are able to engage globally as well as locally. But the environment in which we work... So you're saying you're too stretched? Too stretched. Too okay. stretched to be able to um, to engage as rigorously as we would like to engage. All right. Before I come to you, Professor Anjala, let's uh, listen to one Professor Tanga Odoi, who's a professor at the Makere University, where, of course, Professor Mazuri taught for many years. This is what he had to say. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the world, Africa and Uganda at this critical stage, has lost Ali Mazrui, professor of political science. I think Ali Mazrui is one of the few international scholars who have been heralded across ideological boundaries across continents and political divides. One, for the simple reason that Ali Mazrui, this scholarly work, his critic of government does not have boundaries, does not have a government at any one time which could pay him money for him to drum support for that government. So he laid a foundation of scholarly work which will be contested but may not be equaled for the years after him. So I see Ali Mazuri first as a scholar in Makerere, a person who held scholarly work in Makerere, both writing and teaching, at a very difficult time. Any person of intellectual type of Mazuri who was here during the Amin time and criticized the system from within was first of all a difficult threat. Now Ali Mazrui did that from within and did that from without. And he did not mind. He actually cared more to meet the person or the government and the leader he criticized. He would even say he wants to meet Amin, even when he has criticized him. And that's very rare with the political critics. Now the second is that Ali Mazrui internationally is known as a critic of bad governance. Whether that governance is US, 
whether it is Britain, <coughs> whether it is Africa, whether it is Uganda, Ali Mazuri would position himself to criticize that government. At the height of the Cold War, he was very critical of capitalism and how capitalism got embedded into African states without Africans knowing that capitalism was going to consume them. And I found, I find most of his writings, uh, most of his critics, criticism on capitalism, very on spot. Professor Tanga Odoi there from the Makere University in Uganda on how he remembers the late Professor Mazru and the impact uh, that mark that he's left in the world today. Uh, Professor Wanjala, coming back to you, seeing that the final stages of his life he spent away abroad and highly recognized there, appreciated, honored, um, and as well as living a mark there too. You have the likes of Ngoge Wathiongo, the same. So what is it one would wonder about Kenya that we see these great minds, brilliant stars, head out of the country and continue with their work out there? Is there a lack of an appreciation here? Or is it that space you're talking about that there isn't sufficient and there is no that appreciation here as well? Well, one thing about uh, Mazrui, just as we've heard from um, our Makerere colleague, is that uh, he was not the concept of the alienated scholar, a scholar who works from the fringe of society. Uh, he could take on issues like uh, at the beginning of his career, he wrote so much about uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, calling him all sorts of, you know, giving him all sorts of titles. If you look at the back issues of transition, uh, he's engaging with uh, those uh, uh, politicians. There's a way in which he interacted with them on an equal basis, not from the basis of being a, a, a little, I know, a lesser motto because he's a, an intellectual. So there is a way in which he, had, he enjoyed some familiarity with those uh, uh, leaders so that when it came to writing, however passionate, however critical he was of them, he still integrated with them and they recognized him. Mm. Uh, but of course there, is a, a, there are scholars who sort of operate f on the margin of government. Uh, like Nketia in, in Ghana, the musicologist, uh, he did his research but worked with the, the government. So there is a way in which uh, he was integrated. Uh, I know that uh, Mazrui's personality contributed so much to the way he operated. Now, of course, uh, we have had uh, uh, Ngugi and uh, uh, other scholars who have been critical, who have also taken up you know, a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the government. But you see, there is a way in which Ngugi is uh, you know, a wholesale uh, socialist literary critic, uh, to the extent that, uh, in fact, governments feel nervous about him. But Mazuri was had a way of uh, balancing the act. He could criticize and then give some objective. Uh, he would balance so that when he's talking about Amin, Amin was more or less uh, uh, a soldier, but he could see some merit in okay. Amin. In, in, so that kind of liberalism of Mazuri gave him that stature where he could not be completely ostracized or, re, you know, rejected by politicians. Professor Mnane, so what is it then back to the question of what the environment is back here? Because even the Bible says a prophet perhaps is never much appreciated at home. Mm. So is it the case we are seeing that with this... Uh, um, excellent minds that they find with their work this is perhaps not where they're able to exercise it to the fullest and it is received the way perhaps they'd want that kind of uh, feedback? Um, let me digress a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think both Mazuri and Gogi mm. received their accolades in East Africa mm. before they went out. Okay. Uh, we read Ngoge when we were in high school, and we also had Omazrui when we were there, and they were operating in East Africa and they had made their name. The attraction they got from outside was because of what they had done here. Um, Mazrui talks about 
when he was running away from Uganda. Then there was a problem in Nairobi. He wanted to come to the University of Nairobi, and the University of Nairobi was not accommodating. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Kenya was not willing to accept this person. And that's why he went out and stayed out. And Goge, the same story. He was here until he went into detention. And when he came out, again, we did not accommodate him. So he had to go. These people were forced outside by the environment of the day, um, mainly because of their, whatever it is that they had done. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, they are not the only ones. There are other people who feel uh, that they are not, not simply appreciated, but actually they are not acceptable. And uh, I, I hope that that has changed to the point where people feel they are not acceptable uh, and they have to go because they are not acceptable mm. politically and socially or whatever it is. But I think that that should change. But those people left because of those circumstances. There are others who have left because of what you are saying. The environment is just not conducive. Um, poor pay in the working environment, overcrowded classrooms, and uh, underhanded whatever it is. All those things are real. Yeah. And uh, so people say, nah, so when then we cannot expect these people to produce. Um, writing books, as Chris will say here, and Kimani here, it's a tedious thing. It's very, it requires a lot of thinking. A lot, okay. And uh, the environment is just not that conducive. Not very conducive. Gentlemen, no. we'll take a short break and come back and talk about Professor Mazri, the late, uh, who's a strong Pan-Africanist and the role of Africa, um, especially in global politics. We recently had that uh, U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. What does that say in terms of changing that landscape, if at all, uh, any change? And also now we're talking about referendum in, in the country. He was involved in, uh, he was consulted on constitutional matters, uh, changing of constitutions. What would he say to, to this uh, push that we're seeing in the country. We'll talk about that and more when we return after this break. Fiber Business offers you the fastest, superior quality internet connection to suit your business needs. For only 15,000 shillings per month, Fiber Business 6 with up to 6 Mbps is designed for small offices of between 11 to 20 users. It is ideal for frequent emailing, moderate web browsing and light file sharing. This is Fiber. Enjoy speeds of up to 100 megabits per second. Fiber, powered by Jimmy Telcom. Taking pride in constructing tomorrow's skylines. Adding strength to Kenya's landmarks. Presenting the power for specialized constructions. Cementing the nation's future. Simba Cement, the strength and pride of Kenya. I'm here to help. You and I will get through this together. So don't just smile. Illuminate. New Aquafresh High Definition White. Aquafresh. Feel good protection. Next on My Dream Wedding. I drank the water so relaxed. When we got to Manzoni, they are waiting for the bride to leave the car. The bride is so pressed, she needs to go to the ladies. For better, for worse. My worst moment that made me move away with the children is that he became violent physically and even uh, verbally, and he could not be contained. is giving you five times your daily talk time as bonus to use across all networks. Dial star 141 hash to Shikisha store.
Terms and conditions apply. Rusha na KTN. Hili shindano ni na upeli. Mi raisi. Just SMS the name to. Double two, double one zero. Bati neza kwa wakia. Oga ndra kabisa kabisa kutu. For a chance to win exciting prizes with Burusha na KTN, Ushinde na Samsang. SMS your name to 22210. It's the best cartoon zone. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Spider-Man. Avengers Assemble, SpongeBob SquarePants, Sanjay Craig, plus many, many more on KTN Kids, Monday to Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., only on KTN. This week on E-Curve, we've gone out in search of what's hot and have come back with a bag full of exclusive interviews. Now on a clearly Chereo Konami, Kolo's bag. In your wife's eyes, you two are basically dating. Great performances and style. You know I have interesting topics. That's what's up. Tuesday at 10.05 p.m. Good morning and welcome back to Morning Express. I'm Sophia Wanuna. Today on the Person of Interest, we are paying tribute to the late Professor Ali Mazrui, who passed on Ali yesterday morning. Uh, his body is set to be flown to Kenya. He will be buried in Mombasa, where he was born on Saturday. And with me in studio are three professors. Yes, brilliance here as well. Uh, help me to just remember... Uh, trace back uh, his journey and also what to remember the lessons that perhaps we can learn now and I'll come to you professor Kimani Njogu a strong pan-africanist uh, uh, pan uh, professor Mazrui was when he began weighing in on matters Africa and the role she plays in the global politics and Kenya more so and you look at the recent meets like the one I just mentioned earlier that was in America Africa leaders and the US president one of a kind how has that changed from when he started writing about it in terms of Kenya perhaps you can start with that and in general Africa in the world I think that it is important to first of all appreciate um, the fact that Pan-Africanism itself um, goes back to the 1920s uh, during the uh, Marcus Garvey uh, as well as the earlier um, you know, uh, Pan-Africanists. And that uh, um, the engagement with Pan-Africanism for Ali Mazrui um, enters through that understanding of global, of global politics and the connection between the continent of Africa as well as the diaspora. So one would look at Africa in relation to the African-American world as well as in relation to uh, the Caribbean world. And the connections in terms of uh, the inspiration and the shared histories and the place of race um, in this whole, uh, in this whole uh, political scenario. Now, uh, right from the beginning, um, Ali Mazri appreciated that Africa's history had been um, uh, rubbed off global history through the experience of colonialism. And that was important for Africa to reinscribe itself mm -hmm. as a continent um, and to articulate its position in global politics as well as in terms of its contribution to global development. Because quite often um, uh, it is forgotten that Europe and the United States really developed on the um, backbone of Africa, whether it is in terms of uh, natural resources or whether it is in terms of the slave trade and, oh, and, yeah. and our Africans you know, uh, being uh, sent over to work in the plantations and so on. And it's this consciousness of these connections um, that drove Ali Mazrui to really uh, uh, see the continent of Africa as a continent that has potential of liberating itself 
uh, not just political liberation, because mm -hmm. he does talk a lot about political liberation and the role that uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, you know, uh, um, Kaunda, Nyerere, and others played in the liberation of the country of Africa, but also for Africa to provide direction in terms of its own development agenda and the development of um, its own form of democracy and its own voicing, you know, um, so that Africa is not seen to be a footnote in global politics. Now, how that, how that now relates to the recent, you know, uh, renaissance of Africa, if one were to call it that, is, the, uh, is almost a reinscription of Africa in the global um, arena. And Africa saying, you know something? We can, in fact, determine our own destiny. And I think that uh, uh, Ali Mazrui would relate to that type of thinking. Uh, in, in, in one of his most recent uh, uh, writings, he does actually pay tribute to South Africa uh, to the extent that unlike other African countries that uh, within a decade you know, um, uh, regressed into violence, South Africa, after Mandela, has been able to have regular elections and acceptable you know, elections and so on, and that South Africa has <coughs> provided the way and that the rest of Africa could actually learn something from South Africa. Mm. I think that um, Ali Mazrui's uh, uh, position is about Africa reaffirming its rightful place in the global arena and not being read uh, from outside, but actually reading itself properly as uh, the home of mankind, as a continent that had its own civilization before that civilization was um, interfered with, a country that is blessed with extensive natural resources, but whose actual hill seems to be bad governance and poor quality of leadership. And that has been his commitment that really Africa needs to come up with alternative leadership, a leadership that is transformative, a leadership that's driven by democracy and human rights and an understanding of, um, uh, of, of, of leadership as service to the people other than uh, service to the self. Mm. So in terms of um, really the recent events in the United States, I think that was very important, uh, very, very important to the extent that again, Africa was able to speak. Uh, some of us feel a little uncomfortable uh, with the summoning, as it were, or the calling. I think that should be really a reversal of, you know, it should be the, the rest of the world coming to Africa than Africa going to, uh, to, to those yeah. other parts of the world. I think that with regard to the referendum discussions, mm -hmm. uh, Ali Mazrui would most likely take the same position as Yash, Yashpal Gai that maybe the time is not right okay. for the referendum and that maybe we needed to we need to give it a little space all right yeah. and we'll continue with this shortly but i also want to invite our viewers you're watching this and you'd like to weigh in share your thoughts how you remember the late professor the phone numbers are on your screen you can call in and be part of our discussion this morning professor wanjala he talks about um, professor njogu says that uh, Mazri would have wanted a situation where Africa is in charge of her own destiny. But even when you look at this Ebola that is really ravaging parts of West Africa and the approach and how the world is looking at this, that unless the West really just does marshal the resources and come to help, then really it's uh, a situation that will go out of hand. Do you see Africa getting to that place anytime soon where she's truly uh, in solid control of her, her destiny? I think that uh, uh, we understand that uh, he didn't look for theories outside Africa. Mm -hmm. That's why he engaged with uh, Nkrumah, Nyerere, and so on. And when you look at uh, the problems that we have as a continent, uh, I think that is really the approach where uh, our own scientists, because we have institutions, uh, we have uh, research organizations like ICPE, uh, uh, Camry, we have institutions which could undertake research uh, where there is a marriage between tradition and modernity. Because Mazuri talks of the triple heritage, uh, drawing from Africa, drawing from the West, and that triple heritage can be also interpreted 
in the science research. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, I think that uh, the same organizations which had been put there by the colonialists, like the East African community, ECOWAS, I mean, the organizations like uh, uniting the whole of French-speaking Africa, uh, there is a way in which during the colonial period, they served uh, the colonial master. But with independence, some of these organizations are now uh, reinventing themselves. Mm. Like the East African community is now thinking more of, in terms of economics right. uh, and so on. And then echoes so that when we have uh, even war in the Great Lakes, there is a way in which Africa has asserted herself. Right. And the role of uh, the thinking of such leaders as Mbeki, uh, African Renaissance, really it is built on uh, African uh, philosophy, African consciousness. Okay. So I think that Masri will lay that base for us to draw our own theories from our own home ground. From home ground. Yes. Let's speak to Patrick, who's calling us from Naivasha. Patrick, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for calling. Go ahead yes. with your contribution. Uh, I'm very happy because the Greek stands the forest and the Missouri. And uh, uh, Professor Monene, to take this chance to say something from the Missouri. So we can really declare we went to the forest and he was a good man, I guess. Yeah, and then Mr. Bukhamonet called me later. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, there, um, sharing and uh, sending your condolences to the family and saying that he was a great man. Uh, Professor Mune, I'll come to you because uh, Professor Mazri is also very passionate about matters of his religion, uh, being a Muslim and Islam in general. But in a recent meet, you had, uh, we had uh, Africa intelligence chiefs come and talk about radicalization being one of the biggest challenge uh, facing the continent now in the counter-terrorism strategies or war on terror, if you like. And as far as what he put out and what he spoke about when it came to fundamentalism or um, extremism, how did he address himself to this issue? Where on one hand, yes, he's passionate about his religion, but on the other hand, there's this challenge in as far as extremism that arises and those that are you choosing to use doctrine for their own selfish um, ambitions or ends, if you like. Um. I think it put Mazru in an awkward situation. He was a good Muslim, a very good defender of Islam and the Islamic way of life. And uh, he did his best to try and address the root causes or the exactly what is it that is making people do what they do. Um, Mazru never came up with his own version of Islam. Um, it could not be said to be a leader of any particular line of Islamic thought. Um, he would not be tolerant of some of the activities that people engage in in the name of uh, religion. But he did not come out as loudly as some other people condemning one version or the other. What he tried to do is to try and understand why it is that they are doing that. Mm -hmm. or as bad as it is, why are they doing that? And, uh, and the values that make them do that and maybe try to understand uh, what it is. Um, in that sense, then, he was a bit hesitant to plunge into it. Um, because if he came out condemning everything, then uh, he would be seen to be remiss of what, what forces are there that are there. If he... Uh, uh, accommodate uh, accommodate the, the, the activities of uh, those people, then he's still in a, an awkward, it, it was an awkward position to be. And since it was expected that he would have an opinion, then that put him in a very awkward position. Yeah. And what he tried to do is, can we get deep down into this thing? Why are people doing this The thing? root causes. The root causes. And this is something that, he t uh, not just about Islam, is something he, he started writing about terrorism in the 1960s and uh, pointing out why do we have terrorists? Mm. And can we address that thing that makes somebody take 
actions that are actually aimed at hurting people. Okay. What is it? What is it? Yeah. Professor Njogu, you agree? Yeah, I think that um, uh, it is important right from the onset to create a distinction between Islam and terrorism, that the two uh, are different, and that uh, terrorism uh, can be found within any uh, religious persuasion. So, you know, you could actually have Christians who mm. are terrorists, Terrorist. yeah, and so on. Uh, now, with regard to Ali Mazuri's position, um, I think that he was much more, in he was an intellectual. He was not a, a religious fanatic. Uh, he was a follower of Islam. So he adhered to the tenets of Islam and so on. Um, but he was an intellectual, and intellectuals are interested in the reasons things exist. Mm -hmm. So he would be much more interested in finding out, for example, why we have a huge uh, generation of young people at the Kenyan coast who are recruited into, into, into uh, Al-Shabaab, for example. Mm -hmm. He would be interested in that. And his solution would be marginalization that these young people feel excluded from the mainstream of economic life, a social life, and so on, and that we need to address that. We need to address the root causes of the problem other than assuming that a security solution is the only solution so that uh, he would see the complexity of things other than uh, 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 suggesting a one-off solution. Um, he, would, he would say, look, even as you undertake the security operations, do address the critical issues mm -hmm. that have brought uh, to the fore uh, uh, terrorists. Uh, with regard to Iraq, obviously he would be totally opposed to what the Americans were doing yeah. in Iraq. Professor Anjala, you want to weigh in on that? I think that uh, if we look at his uh, thought, his was, as a scholar, all the time he was bringing out the facts to bear and leaving uh, the reader to judge. For example, when he talks about he's in comparative politics, when he's comparing uh, Zimbabwe with Algeria uh, and perhaps Kenya and so on, there is uh, no bias towards uh, Islam. He just he goes for the Islamic world as well as the uh, Christian world almost with equal objectivity. But of course. Uh, at the early part when uh, there, were, there was party formation in this country, mm. you, may have say, you may say that uh, he showed a little sympathy with uh, the party that uh, arose from the coast. But it was not in uh, that kind of uh, fanatical way as uh, Professor Mena said. There is a, a very balanced view. Uh, as an elder, he just uh, you know, presented uh, the facts. And well, one could see him imagining, you know, coming from Mombasa. For example, when he, when he addressed the, the constitutional team, you know, uh, uh, under Jasper, yeah, you know, he, he came with a fully fellow coastal people. Yeah. But he stood out as the objective voice of reason. That he was. Rather than a fanatical one. All right. Harrison yes. Kinyanju is also joining us on the line. Harrison, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Go ahead with your contribution. Yeah, I'll believe that. Hello? Hello. Um, Harrison, I'll ask you to kindly turn down the volume on your television so that we can be able to hello. communicate. Hello, hello. I'm, I'm saying. Yes. I would like to send my condolences. Hello? hello. Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'd like to send my condolences to the family of Professor Alman Zoe. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is quite untimely departure. We really feel this loss and the, uh, for the whole of Africa. Actually, I'd like to congratulate all the panelists who are there. They are talking very well, and I think they have the interests of Kenyans at heart. And I, I wish that they too will be like Professor Alman Zoe. As, as the pillar of this country in education. Thank All right. You. Thank you. And you're gonna, uh, from Nakuru, we also have Oscar on the line. Uh, Oscar, good morning. Good morning, Sophia. Thank you very much for calling. 
Yeah, most of them here. I would uh, like to first uh, pass my condolences to the family. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not read much about Professor, but uh, I just want the panelists to help me with understanding of his particular ideological leaning. I've heard Professor Chris mention that he was a liberalist. I've heard uh, Munene mention that he spoke uh, very religiously against communism and capitalism at some point. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, just get to know from each one of them uh, what uh, they think of his dominant ideological leaning uh, uh, generally. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your thoughts, my name is... Yeah. Um, let's um, take off from the earlier part. Um, yeah. Professor Mazrui is what I consider an intellectual warrior. From about 1900 to today, there has been this constant friction mm. on who interprets Africa and for whom. On one side, we have mainly our colonizers, the Euros. Okay? They insist on interpreting Africa for themselves and for the Africans. That's why sometimes we are told we should not be thinking because somebody else is going to do some thinking for us. And from 1900, there has been that constant, the, the Pan-African beginnings. Eh? We had uh, two meetings in London, one by colonial, colonial officials and the other one by uh, African American people, black people all over on that issue. And among them was uh, Du Bois, eh? mm -hmm. who came up with the argument that mm -hmm. what would shape the 20th century is the issue of the colors, race. And it turned out to be uh, very accurate. Mm -hmm. Over time, as colonialism was entrenched, we had a new team of intellectual warriors who were challenging the prevailing perception of Africa. And among these, paradoxically, you notice in the 1930s, eh? after Mussolini invaded um, Ethiopia, and the rise of that strong Pan-Africanist feeling, there was Jomo Kenyatta. He's uh, facing Mount Kenya was a direct attack on the philosophy of colonialism. So it was uh, I.M.S. Eh? Mm -hmm. yes. and uh, Senghor at the same time. Later on, uh, we have Sheikh Anta Diop. He comes up with a very strong attack on the myth about Euro superiority. And uh, the, it went to a climax with uh, who? With uh, George James, eh? the stolen legacy. So we have these intellectual warriors. Who, and then in the 1960s at independence, we have this big thrust of Africans now saying we are going to do it on ourselves. And Mazui was one of those people who became a very good intellectual warrior, putting the African position on the line as he understood it. Mm. Uh, at first he was seen to be wavering a little bit, but people took pride in the fact that he was one of us. And he was making interpretation. We may disagree, but he was doing the interpretation, but not somebody else. And then later on we move on. That's where you get people like John Beatty with his views on uh, religion. Mm. Uh, we had that troublemaker called Okot Pibitek, mm. who accused everybody of being a smuggler. Uh, we had, you know, the Ngoge, we had the Wallace Oyinga. All these, we, we saw these, these are African intellectual warriors because they were claiming the African space at the intellect, intellectual level. The claim that was prevalent at the time in the 60s was that Africans were intruders into the intellectual arena. Again, not just intellectual arena, but also geopolitical arena. And so when Mazrui's writings come up and taking the, like his cultural forces in world politics, eh? um, a brilliant book, ranks with all the others that were getting the you know, publicity. So he comes out and says, the African position is this. And even today we have that debate. Who should be interpreting Africa for Africans? Yeah. And um, some, some of us insist only Africans can, can interpret Africa 
for Africans. Professor Njugu, as you weigh in on uh, his ideological leaning, looking at his, the triple heritage, and he talks about his mother tongue having been mm. born a Swahili yeah. and then going to school in English and then praying in Arabic. Mm. Did that come out clearly towards the end where he leaned in terms of ideology? Well, I think that um, it's always very difficult to pigeonhole uh, an intellectual in terms of their ideological leaning because uh, it's political ideological inclination. Mm -hmm. Because uh, intellectuals see value in different thrusts, uh, philosophical thrusts. So he would see value in, uh, in uh, certain aspects of the socialist you know, ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, for a moment, you would think he's a social democrat. Um, on the other hand, you would see a certain um, affinity to liberal democracy, you know, uh, and so on. But, but for intellectuals, um, it's very dangerous, actually, to, to say that politically, this is their ideological positioning, because they see value in different spaces. Now, um, with regard to, to, to language, he has released two critical books. Um, the one, one of the books is The Power of Babel uh, on governance in Africa and the whole question of language, uh, in which he talks about the complexity of, uh, of the language situation in Africa and the ways in which, to the extent that we uh, attach more value to English and French and Portuguese as the languages of governance we exclude the majority of the African people mm -hmm. in the governance agenda. And in his view, it is critically important to bring on board as many of our people uh, uh, through African languages. And so he, in the power of Babel, he talks about the power of multilingualism, the power of um, different languages contributing to the development of Africa. In fact, if you look at uh, the place of African languages in agriculture, most of our work in agriculture is actually undertaken not through English or French or Portuguese or Spanish, actually through African languages. Mm. Most of our work in the transport sector is undertaken through African languages. So in the part of Bible, he's really celebra celebrating, um, uh, celebrating multilingualism, but seeking to answer the question, how is it that in our constitutions, uh, the languages of, of the legislature, the languages of the judiciary are actually foreign languages? Okay. So you have French as the language of the judiciary, mm. uh, English as the language of the judiciary, as parliament, as the executive, and so on. So he, sh he tries to, s to discuss this contradiction. Right. The other book is actually um, on, on, on Kiswahili and the role of Kiswahili uh, for regional integration. Right. Uh, so the, the, the political economy of an African language in which he traces the history of Kiswahili and the potentiality of Kiswahili okay. to bring East Africa together. All right. yeah. Professor Wanjala, your thoughts on his ideological leaning? Uh, his ideology, for a long time, he was uh, very concerned with the role of the scholar mm -hmm. in society, uh, the role of the intellectual. That's why he came up with that definition of his, uh, where he defines the intellectual as a man who handles ideas effectively. Uh, but there is also a way in which uh, he drew from the African situation. That's why many people uh, describe him as a, a historian. But he's more of a, a theorist, in fact. But his theories, unlike today where people are so fascinated by theories from, from the West. Uh, he drew his theories from this, the, the soil here. So a scholar uh, and his self-preservation, this again is in the Muslim philosophy, mm. where uh, a person, you have to seek for your own self-preservation. He, he, he argued, especially in the trial of Christopher Kigbo, that a gifted person like uh, Christopher Kibo, he had a role to himself to make sure that uh, he does not operate like a common soldier and put his life on the line in a foolish way. 
uh, he celebrated Okigbo and uh, actually criticized him for having joined a very narrow cause, fighting the Biafran war, mm. being on the side of Biafra rather than fighting for the bigger picture of Nigeria. That really, that book really spells out his uh, standpoint as far as uh, the role of the intellectual is concerned. Okay. Yes. Before we bring this to a close, our time is up, but I want to put this to each of you. I know at the beginning you did talk about the challenges in terms of bringing up more, perhaps, Mazuri's. He was a special one, as you said, perhaps there will never be another like him. Uh, but mentoring more people that would perhaps go in that line, that educational reforms pose a huge challenge or the structure as is currently. But for a man that is Professor Mazrui who created new ideas and challenged current thinking, what is it that it will take to have more of such people. Many are watching right now, uh, some are in school, but briefly from each of you, what is it that it will take to have more people? Because that is needed in a country where politics seems to be squeezing the life out of everybody and the politicians with their half-truths and lack of truth completely fill the space. We need more of perhaps sanity and direction in more of ideology and understanding the deeper issues. I'll start with you. One, well, um, don't give up. <laughs> and um, those who are listening and watching read a lot of books uh, from everywhere. And um, the, be fascinated by ideas eh? because ideas are enjoyable. Okay. And so have fun in um, enjoying ideas. Even if you don't agree with somebody, at least listen to that person. And then they're trashing after the fact. Uh, but uh, because the best debates are usually after you listen to somebody and you take everything he or she has to give, and then you respond in a more effective way. Mm. And th that can be very enjoyable. And maybe uh, KTN can do more shows that uh, <laughs> encourage that kind of thing. Okay, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that uh, there are two things. One, as a country, we must start celebrating ideas. I think for far too long, we have celebrated two things. One, we have celebrated money. We think that money is and the land. solution <laughs> to all our problems. Yes. And we have celebrated, I think, well, of course, land, we've celebrated politics. We think that politics, uh, the more political we are, the, in terms of political affiliation, the better the country will become. I think that the time has come, uh, as we bury Ali Mazrui, to really start celebrating ideas and to start celebrating our intellectuals. You know, how is it possible mm. that those people who have devoted their lives to scholarship and the pursuit of education cannot make a contribution to our country? Surely they have a contribution to make. The other thing that we really need to do is to tap on the diaspora. I think there are many scholars, many innovators, many brilliant people, Kenyans in the diaspora, who come home and yet we don't tap on them. I think our universities must be liberal enough to allow for these scholars to talk with our students and to really create the space that is required for them to be able to engage and to mentor, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, scholars. And, and also to invest in publishing. I think that we have to invest in publishing as a country. The annual budget should have a, you know, sufficient money for research and publishing. Okay, finally, Professor Wanchala. Uh, I really feel that uh, Mazri is the example of uh, a real scholar in the classical sense. Even when Mazri was going to talk to kindergarten children, he made sure that his lecture was prepared. Wow. And he left a copy with the school. So he's a, he was a man who d didn't only talk, but he wrote. Secondly, he built teamwork. You know, when you look at most of his publications, he has co-authored with his younger colleagues. In fact, uh, when Okewa Chui was working with uh, Mazrui, he referred to himself as an academ academic houseboy mm -hmm. in Mazrui's office because he was being mentored. I think that <coughs> scholars must mentor each other, especially the older scholars must Correct. learn to mentor the new ones so that at least we grow. 
Yeah. And I think Missouri is really the best example. Very well said. So that space is not empty, it's not left mm. vacant, mm. Uh, that there are more and more coming up. Uh, Professor Chris Swanjala, literary scholar, uh, with us also Professor Masharia Munene, Professor of History and International Relations at USIU, and also Professor Kimani Njogu, Director of Tuaweza Communication and Chair of the National Kiswahili Association. We thank you all so much for being with us today. I've never hosted three professors at a go, so <laughs> an honor for me as well, and a great treat a way of remembering uh, Professor Mazrui and also just the challenge that is on all of us uh, to keep his legacy um, alive and going and his memory in terms of learning from what uh, he stood for. And as we told you earlier, his body expected uh, in the country for the burial on Saturday in Mombasa where he was born. It was his wish that he be buried in his hometown that is in Mombasa. He had been um, living in New York and teaching there as well and we continue to update you on that story uh, the late professor Ali Mazrui being our person of interest this Tuesday stay with us after the short break we return with your health it is breast cancer month and as we talk about that today a special focus on breast cancer in men don't go away